Yes, uh, Swami would say this to us. He says, do not differentiate between your temple and your office. There is no difference. It's in your mind. You think this is spiritual, ah. that is worldly. That's where you go wrong. I, I, I believe that understanding will come to me uh, eventually. But right now, my guru and the higher powers who are looking over me, they will give me only what I need to know. Mm -hmm. I mean, Swami himself said this. Is, Don't try to understand me. Enjoy me. Because, and he wasn't trying to put us in a blind belief kind of a space, but he knew that human logic has its limitations. Uh, even, even devotees who've been with Swami for years still uh, cannot fathom his ways and all. Right. One of the uh, there was never a time when he came and spoke to me, even when he was in the form, mm -hmm. to give me certain spiritual wisdom. No. Uh, his grace would pour irrespective of whether I was near him or far. Uh, one, one of the reasons why we come on this earth is it's some call it a university, some call it a gymnasium. Mm -hmm. Why do we go to a gymnasium? We carry heavy weights over there. Why must we yeah. do that? But that resistance, in the, the, it helps us strengthen our muscles. Yeah. The same is, is with this kind of a life. It's a gymnasium. We come here to, spend, to strengthen our spiritual muscles. The resistance that Maya provides us is what we seek to grow. Yeah. Naresh Sharma. He's only in his mid-thirties, but his storehouse of spiritual understanding is already considerable. While very close to Sri Satya Sai Baba, curiously it seemed to be Baba himself who pointed Naresh into the direction of Paramahansa Yogananda. Naresh explains it all in this account of his own spiritual awakening. Welcome to Sojourns. This interview was recorded at Sai Baba's ashram in Puttaparthi, India in January. 2013. Uh, I was 15 when I left school. That was the time when my eldest sister, she shifted to Bangalore. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were incidents in her life which led her to Swami. Ah. Uh, some minor tragedies. Mm -hmm. A young child suffered burns, I think, on a Diwali night while playing with crackers. And Swami very, not Swami actually, um, she tried all options that she could, but um, whatever doctors she met, they told her that the child was young and the burns were deep and they would um, not heal that fast and once he grows up maybe surgery could be, a uh, plastic surgery could be an option, something right. like that. Mm -hmm. So it's something like this, she stayed in an army area and uh, a lot of the retired generals and brigadiers and all, they, they stayed and much of, many of them were devotees of Swami. Mm -hmm. I think one lady came to her and she said, why don't you take her to Swami? And the, she was a desperate mother. Uh, I don't think she would have ordinarily wanted to go to Swami, a person with the Afro hair and all. But she was a desperate mother. She said, why not? So she took her son over there, thinking Swami would come, bless him or whatever. Swami came, gave darshans and left. Nothing much. But uh, she mentions that as she was coming out, she saw a Japanese looking boy who could hardly speak English. And he asked, what's wrong with him? And she explained. And he said, bring him along. And he took uh, my nephew to his house, took Swami's Vibhuti, and even though he couldn't speak English well, he, re he recited the Gayatri Mantra, and he poured Vibhuti on his face. Now my sister tells me that she, to, in her eyes she could see almost changes happening immediately. And he said, here's the Vibhuti, put it for one week, apply it on his face, and he'll be okay. She took it, and she followed it, and in one week he was okay. Mm. And uh, she took him to this uh, specialist, you know, for his regular checkups, mm -hmm. and this guy was stunned. He says, what's this? And she explained, and uh, he said, would you take me along with you someday? She uh -huh. said, sure. And she became an ardent devotee, and uh, she would tell us all the things that would happen in a house, you know, vibhuti or whatever manifesting, mm -hmm. those kind of things. My mother and I heard that, and we weren't sure what, what she was talking about. For us, it was okay, she's gone to some Baba the millions right. that we and, have around in this country. And there were hundreds of Babas there are hundreds around in this country. Swamis. And uh, I wasn't sure. So my mom, um, during one of her breaks, she, she went over there and she called me back and she said, whatever she's saying is correct. I, I've seen it with my own eyes. It's, it's true. So um, I had a very scientific outlook to things. And I Probably said, a healthy skepticism too. Yes, I think that works well. I mean, mm -hmm. unless you go through that, um, if you just believe blindly, it doesn't help you much. No. Somewhere along in the future, doubts will come back again. It's yeah. better to confront them when they are. Mm -hmm. So, well, I went there and I saw everything as well. 
And uh, more than anything else, I saw a transformation in my sister. She would wake up very early in the morning and do suprabhatam and all those things. That is what impressed me, I think, more, where I saw changes in her lifestyle, more than miracles happening. She did not have somebody standing over her. She wasn't being lectured every day. She did this from her heart because she wanted to. Oh, yes. And um, honestly, uh, my brother-in-law, my sister, they lived a very worldly life. You know, they had friends, parties Mm -hmm. and all that. So this was very impressive. She had a spiritual um, uh, nature, but Mm -hmm. to see her wake up in the morning and do suprabhatam and do havan and all, that that was quite impressive. And I was there for a month, and uh, I would ask her, would you take me to this Baba once? And she promised me, she said, yes, I will. And uh, my month almost came to an end, and I had to leave the next day. And uh, I knew there's no way she could take me. So I don't know what got into me, I was 15 years of age, and if you go to Bangalore now and try the public transports, they're horrible. Back then, they were really horrible. Yeah, I'm I mean, sure. I'm familiar with trying to navigate the traffic yeah. to get to Brindavan oh, yes. to see Baba in Whitefield. Yeah. So it's it's just a mess. So, it is a mess. So, even today. So did, did you are you suggesting that you found a bus route and got on a bus and went by yourself? Three hours it took me. Three hours I, from one part of Bangalore me? to the other. Yes, what uh-huh. should have taken me one hour? Because I, I think I took the long route, too many suggestions from too many people. <laughs> so I reached there, well, uh, it was evening time, this was 92, and uh, these were the days Swami was obviously walking, Yeah. good old days, and uh, evening darshan. And he, the bhajan started, and um, I had no expectations, I just, and Swami walks out, and uh, he walks all through, takes different pattern circles mm-hmm. all throughout in Brindavan this is and all I can remember is my eyes wouldn't leave him uh, I know different people have had emotional uh, uh, you know uh, reactions to this but um, uh, my eyes wouldn't leave him and uh, and they say th- this parenthetically correct me if I'm wrong but my understanding is having been there myself that in Brindavan in Whitefield he was a more relaxed Baba a slightly yes. different Baba than he is I'm he glad here. I'm glad you mentioned that. That is so true. More less infor- um, more informal and more relaxed. Uh, I hate saying this, but I would never like coming to Puttaparthi to have a darshan <laughs> because of how I knew him there. Yeah, he, yeah. He was a friend, mother. Yeah. Very open. That's so true. Yeah. I'm glad people see the same because we feel so. I, a lot of the other boys with whom I worked, all of us felt so. So continue your story. Your eyes are not leaving him as he's zigzagging around the mandir, around the prayer hall there. Yes. And he walks very close to me. There's no eye contact, nothing. But I look at him and he goes. And uh, I don't know from where this voice inside my heart tells me, if anybody can answer all your questions, he can. <laughs> and there was a conviction. It wasn't just a, a thought. It was a conviction. So you're still wrestling with the, this download of questions with very few, if any, answers so far, and you're getting that internal prompting that here's the source who can answer your yes. questions. Yes, yes. Uh, actually, by this time, I had pretty much suppressed those questions because I, had, I was totally unable to deal with them, mm-hmm. and I didn't know why. They would drive, drive me crazy if I pursued them. So I just had put them somewhere, and if I found a good book or something, by then our... Uh, country had opened up, there was a lot of things coming in from the West in terms of channels and all, mm-hmm. so I would pursue that and uh, if something uh, gave me information in in direction of the questions that I was seeking I would I would be interested in that but otherwise I just buried the questions yeah. somewhere so um, I asked my sister how, how do we meet with Baba, I mean does he talk to you or something and she told me something about an interview and how difficult it was and the other option was to write him letters. So uh, I think I went back to Bombay, and uh, about a year later, I wrote him a letter, and I put all the questions in the letter. And I remember I had some space, so I put some additional questions which I was very curious about, but uh, which somewhere I felt weren't worth asking. But I just put them, and uh, I think with great devotion, I said. I hope you can answer these for me. Do you have any idea, recollection of how many questions there might have been? 10, 15 of them? 15, 16 of them. Okay, all right. Yeah. Good number. Yeah. And uh, I closed the letter and I realized I didn't have the address. So I just wrote, Sathya Sai Baba, Puttaparthi, India. Probably get there. <laughs> and I sent it. And I'm sure he received it because a year later, 
he was in Brindavan and this one uh, morning my whole family had been there and my brother-in-law it was a Sunday so la huge crowd and uh, you know Brindavan right Very and, well, um, yeah. in the early days there's this railway crossing over there mm -hmm. so if traffic. so many people come out and the, there's traffic nobody moves it's it's a very tough thing. So my brother-in-law very smartly he went out early, got the car ready, so that we can all just go in the car and just zoom off, uh, and avoid all the traffic. Uh, so we quickly got in, and um, the car stopped. <coughs> Excuse me. The car stopped for a second or two, and uh, to this day I don't know what got into me, but I just ran out of the car <laughs> towards the to the, towards a bookshop nearby with all my family screaming behind me. Where are you going? Where are you going? I mean, nephews followed me because they were curious what's happening. So I went to, I go to this bookshop and uh, I, I'm clueless as to what I want over this. And the guy is very helpful. He says, can I help you with something? Do you need something? I said, I don't know. I'm just looking around. And then my eyes fall on this one book, ochre colored book, a strange looking man looking right into my eyes and saying, pick me. This is what you want. <laughs> and, um, you know, I've been staying alone all my life. So I have this habit of bargaining to ensure nobody cheats me. You sure? Yeah. So I, he, I ask him, how much is this? says 60 bucks so I don't I okay I just check my pocket luckily I have 60 bucks and I give it to him and I take that book and I come back into the car with my family still scolding me and uh, as I sit down my nephew is asking why, why what why did you want this book I said I don't know and it suddenly occurred to me what did I just do why did I want this book and I took it home and it just kept lying for three four months and I would just flip it around see those pictures in it and uh, there was something quaintly familiar about it, but um, anyways, my sister, one of my younger sisters, uh, she invited us over to her house, her housewarming ceremony, mm -hmm. uh, which was somewhere in the middle of India, in a place near Pune. So I used to read a lot of books. So since this book was lying around, I said, okay, I won't uh, take any book from the library. I'll, I'll take this book and I'll read it. This book was the autobiography of a yogi. Uh, I, I started reading this book. The house where I was reading it was empty because they hadn't shifted in, so I just took up one corner, put a mattress mattress there, and just I would read this book. My mom, my mom tells me this. She said we got scared looking at you in those days because you were sometimes when we saw you, you were weeping, sometimes when we saw you, you were crying, you looked crazy, and my my family got really worried that he's never read such books, some yogi and long-haired person. Why is he reading this and what's happening to him? They were really worried and my mom wouldn't tell me this because I was very independent, but she didn't want me to read it anymore. So um, my eldest sister was with us. One morning she comes on the table and she tells us, and she was one of those who um, did not want me to read this book. Mm -hmm. So she came, she told us, said, said, Swami came in my dream. And I complained to Swami, Swami, why is he reading that book? Make him stop. We worried for him. And Swami became a little stern and he says, I have put him on this path, for that is the path for him. You will not discourage distract you. him or discourage him from there. And that for me was a second sign because when I was reading this book, it answered all my questions and much more. Same with me. I've shared this book with so many people since then. Because I believe it doesn't matter what religion you are, what class or uh, creed you are, this book will sp speak to you if you're interested in, in matters of s the spirit. You and your My sister? whole family has read the book now. They <laughs> love it. They love it. In fact, uh, uh, my mother tells me this that if she encounters any problems in life, she will go to this book. She's a signed devotee. She will go to this book mm -hmm. and uh, she will invariably find answers to whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. And uh, I know so many more. In fact, um, I feel the same. Uh, I've read this book more than some 10 times now, and I know so many other people who've read it multiple times. And I notice that each time you read it, it, it opens you up in a different way. How did your conviction in Baba grow after this? Well, um, I like to say this. Swami brought me to this path, the autobiography, and the autobiography and the subsequent teachings that I received from uh, Sri Paramahansa Yogananda, my guru now, uh, they helped me understand who Swami was. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's only after, I think, like I said, the autobiography opened me up, opened, it told me who I was. Because when I read the autobiography, the one thing that gave me so much joy was, and, uh, was that the fact that what I read, 
it did not seem as if it was something I'm no learning for the first time. It seemed as if I knew this all along. This book was just confirming it. And surely now you know that that was true. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so it told me who I was in what space, yeah. in what place in life I was. And uh, my respect and love for Swami grew, obviously, yeah. because I knew I was very grateful, very grateful to him that he answered me in such a way. Well, I have come across many more truths, but I've seen that I'm not amongst those. There are some souls who are so blessed that um, they are, how do I say it? They're very aware of how their spiritual process works. I am not. I am totally at the mercy of Swami. And, uh, and uh, he has his way of exposing me the two truths that I'm supposed to know. By the way, this whole book finding, you know, the way mm -hmm. I found, that's not been the, it's not been the only time. Uh, there have been other times where I've been led to books in mysterious ways, again and again, even if I block it out, no, I don't want this. I'm, some power has made sure that I come back to that book again and read it, and only when I read it do I realize, ah, that's why I was meant to read this. A second time. Uh, not just the first time, but multiple times in order. Whether the first time or the second time, but um, no, the first time, or, what I mean is, uh, the, some power will lead me to this book in the bookshop, and I will say, no, I don't want this. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I remember two, three such books, and uh, I w it, w it was bought in front of me in so many different ways. Some person mentioning it, I read it in the newspaper, I read it somewhere else, somewhere else. It's just coming up in front of me again and again, and in very interesting ways. And then I read this, and then I realize, ah, this is why I was meant to. So my understanding has come in that way. So I, I still can't figure out. I'm, I'm like, um, to me, that way each day is exciting. I don't know what will come to me. I guess my obvious question is, does it matter that you know the modality in which this information comes? Well, obviously not. Like I yeah. said, uh, when the time is right, it yeah. will happen. What would you rather have, the insight as to how the information is conveyed to you, or the information? <laughs> I, I believe that understanding will come to me uh, eventually, but right now my guru and the higher powers who are looking over me, they will give me only what I need to know. Mm -hmm. so, so you've got your guru, you, you're extraordinarily familiar with Sai Baba, after yes. all you're here again with your parents yes. in the S block right now, just arriving the other day. Um, what does coming here while well, Sai Baba walked the ashram pathways and now after his body is no longer containing physical life what does it add to you how does it shade in some of the corners and some of the edges for your spiritual pursuit well to be honest Ted, i sai baba being in his form or not uh, has never made much difference to my spiritual life in in a sense that uh, there was never a time when he came and spoke to me even when he was in the form mm -hmm. to give me certain spiritual wisdom no uh, his grace would pour irrespective of whether I was near him or far um, so I had uh, I, I was in sort of close proximity to him till the year 2005 mm -hmm. and after that he had sent me to Bombay and uh, I, I, I wasn't around much. Is this uh, an internal prompting from him that sent you to Bombay? No, um, he had called me for an interview and um, asked me what I was doing and I was actually waiting for him to guide me in my career choice. So, um, and he sent you to Bombay of all places. Well, yes, uh, and that has its own story. <laughs> so, uh, but because I was, he knew I was a film student, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd been very honest and because I knew he did not like uh, his students watching films yeah. and all those things. So when I heard that, I said, I must be honest and tell him, look, this is what I've done. Please tell me, what would you like me to do? And I'll do that. Mm -hmm. And he asked me and I told him I was a film student. And uh, he said, well, then Bombay is the place for you. You must go there. And I said, Swami, I don't want to go. I actually even told my mother, if he asks you, tell him he doesn't want to go. He wants to stay with you. Uh -huh. So uh, but Swami said, no, no. I isn't send you isn't to that interesting? He, he, he wants you to go apart from him physically. Yes, uh, and uh, I was wondering about this sometime later, you know, almost a little sad, that why did he have to send me away? Mm -hmm. um, and my friend with whom I was driving back home, he says, if you have given yourself in his hands, let him use you as his instrument. 
and uh, if he sends you to Bombay, he knows what he's doing. He yield, will just follow. Yield to his guidance. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I'm still struck by the enigma, that's Isaac Tigret's word, of Sai Baba. How does he, I wrote in my blog the other day, in my little newsletter, a lot of people think Baba has an enormous hold over those of us who love him. But I don't think it's a hold at all. I, I think the way in being associated with him helps to see people transform their lives. If their eyes are open, they see the personal transformation going on within them. And it's not that he has a hold over me, it's that I want more of this transformation. And this yes. is how I'm getting it for the first time in my life. Yes. So what do you say to people who say, boy, from what I gather, this Sai Baba's a real enigma. How can you make sense out of him? Well, he is an enigma. Sri Paramahansa Yogananda would say, if you could understand a saint, you would be one. You know? <laughs> Very good. And uh, I mean, Swami himself said, this is, don't try to understand me enjoy me because and he wasn't trying to put us in a blind belief kind of a space but he knew that human logic has its limitations mm -hmm. and there's only so far you can go with it and there is a there's a point in time where reason will have to stop and faith will have to take over because faith is a higher way to mm -hmm. things and um, well that's what it is I mean I am sure people uh, even even devotees who've been with Swami for years still cannot fathom his ways and all. Do you um, think this is all Maya? It is. Do you think this is. is all an illusion, all a dream? Yes, it is. And the course. purpose of this dream for you, Naresh, is? To use the tools that this dream gives me to help my soul evolve. <laughs> it's no and I say it's to awaken from the dream to yes. who you really are. Yes, but Same uh, thing. one thing that I've learned by and by is Maya and ego are not necessarily bad. They seem bad from a spiritual perspective, but when seen with wisdom, they are. They, it, it is the wall against which you push yourself. You know, if you're in space, uh, you want to go somewhere, you'll struggle. There's nothing to push against. But uh, you know, if you if you're in a pool of water, there's a wall. You can use that to push yourself against and go forward. You can use the water if you can teach yourself in a panicky situation how to propel your body by kicking your feet. But slowly. <laughs> this is a, one, one of the reasons why we come on this earth is it's, some call it a university, some call it a gymnasium. Mm -hmm. Why do we go to a gymnasium? We carry heavy weights over there. Why must we yeah. do that? But that resistance, the, the, it helps us strengthen our muscles. Yeah. The same is, is with this kind of a life, it's a gymnasium. We come here to, spend, to strengthen our spiritual muscles. The resistance that Maya provides us is what we seek to grow. The, what was the first word you used, the what that Maya provides us? The, the resistance. The resistance that Maya provides us is what we seek. Yes, what we seek as, as in like uh, you you met Rob, Rob, Robert Schwartz. Yes, I really mentioned you. about uh, my, my soul's plan. Yes, you'll be <laughs> happy to know that you are, are aware of him. Oh yes, it's a lovely book. And uh, more than that, it, uh, I'm glad somebody bought something like that out because it, the soul's plan is a, a concept not very well known, and I think people should know about it. It's so you and I would recommend it to anybody hearing us talk about it right now because Absolutely. it's very helpful. Absolutely. But f tell me more because I want to know about your progress in, in navigating your physical self through your Maya self. In other words, you have to assume that there is no physical self, but we aren't totally in control or in, in a good state with that thought yet because we still pinch our skin and feel the pain mm -hmm. and we know we awaken from dreams during the night into yes. what we perceive to be reality yes but we're being told that this is a dream too so what's your progress that you can document a report to us as you find yourself growing through Maya what's my progress um, how do you know you're coming through it well I understand your question and uh, well, like I said, uh, while we are in Maya, we need to use it in the best way possible to grow away from it. The like, same with ego, you said too. Yes, uh, Swami would say this to us. He says, do not differentiate between your temple and your office. There is no difference. It's in your mind. You think this is spiritual, ah. that is worldly. 
that's where you go wrong. I love that that's when he said everything is prayer. It, it, it's the same. It's, it's, um, if you are in that high seat of consciousness, even in your worldly life, you are in a temple. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we, our mind uh, with all its smartness tries to do this. This is Maya, this is not Maya, this is... And it, not knowing that in doing so, it is being an instrument of Maya itself. Naresh, you're a 35-year-old kid. Where does all this come from? Well, I borrow it from some place and I share it ahead. <laughs> well, yeah, but a lot of people read a lot of books. They don't have the insights you well, have. Well, maybe I'm a old wine in a new bottle. <laughs> Could be. Where do you think you're going to be in another 35 years? Uh, gee, uh, Ted, I'm be taught on this path to live in the now. It would be like it would be self-defeating if we if I thought in the for the next 30 years and see myself yeah. there somewhere, who knows? You're a good Eckhart Tolle student living in the now, which is also Baba's phrase, live Absolutely. in the now. Oh, yes. Not the past, not oh, the yes. future. Why, why, why? Um, and, and the book that he told me twice that he wrote, called A Course in Miracles, talks about the greatest of all miracles, which is the, your ability to change your thoughts in a second. In other words, if you can go from understanding that all of this material world is real to grasping the notion that it's all Maya, that's a huge miracle. It is. Yeah. It is. So you're, you're going through all these steps right now, being fully present in the present moment. Yes. Yet it seems to be limitless. I think one of the things, I'm just sort of floundering here, but I'll try to get, make a point out of it. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's become most important to me is never having been a good student in my younger years, I find that being a student of spirituality is just about the most exciting field I can ever envision because it doesn't have a final course to graduate from. Yes. It's endless. It's endless. And, and meeting you and meeting the person yesterday and Baba will direct me to somebody new tomorrow. They're not all of this caliber, not every discussion or interview, but there's always a nugget that's new to me that sends me over the top saying, oh my goodness, I, I never thought of this before and I wouldn't have think, been thinking of this if I weren't on this path. Probably, yes. So do you share, do you share, uh, I know you do with uh, quite well on YouTube, not YouTube, but Facebook and, and your blog. Mm -hmm. uh, do you go around talking to people? Do you get invited to share your wisdom to groups and individuals? Uh. I have spoken to a group of friends in Bombay um, back in, I think, three, four, three years back uh, when this whole New Age um, information came to me and I realized that we are on the cusp of a change, of a shift. Um, I felt this inner voice telling me that I should go beyond my own shyness. I'm, I'm a, I mentioned this, I'm a shy person, I can't speak. It's very easy for me to sit behind a screen and type something out and share it uh -huh. without revealing who I am. But um, I wasn't uncomfortable talking, but um, I knew it was, it's very difficult to make somebody read what you have said, uh, what, you, what you write, rather than just go to them and maybe present something to them which will appeal to them. So I had a bunch of friends to whom I would give this talk called The Science and Adventure of God. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have done a bit of that, but um, nothing much. I prefer writing. Well, and, share uh, the story because the, the moment is now that you shared with me when you came up to me in the Western Canteen the other day and told me about how Baba helped you over this shyness. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, this was in... Uh, 1999, that was my very, very first interview with Swami. He had called us all in and during the course of the interview, a friend of mine had a three diamond ring mm -hmm. and one of the diamonds had fallen off as it usually does. And uh, he gave the ring to Swami and Swami changed it with a blow. Mm -hmm. He changed the ring from a three diamond ring to a white diamond, one single white diamond mm -hmm. ring, a huge and we enjoyed that. Did and you see it happen? Yes, I did. And it, uh, see, I've never seen that happen. Oh. And I always ask people when I'm asking you, did he literally hold it up in front of his hand, in front of his mouth, and you could see it? And yes, he, uh, he you know, um, in, 
during he was gracing this boy and in the process he was also entertaining us because uh -huh. we have the childish I know most of the kids with me uh, they are ardent devotees of Swami we don't look much forward to the miracle part yeah we enjoy being with Swami sure but whenever we see a miracle we enjoy it oh yeah of course <laughs> yes so when he did that uh, the, the, this he took the ring from him and he asked each one of us how many diamonds are there how many diamonds are there and uh, I don't know Telugu so he yeah. asked me in Hindi did he Kitna diamond I said Swami two Do hai. One he missing, says. two left. Yes. So he kept it in front of us and he blew it. And we saw it turn into a white diamond. You saw it turn? Yes. And we were like, oh, <laughs> whatever. Like, my, my doubts are long since gone, yet look at my reaction. I'm still delighted when I hear stories like this. Of course. I mean, you could be a kid, you could be 60, 70, 80 years old. Of course, you'd love to see something like that. It, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. They're beautiful things. Beautiful interactions with Swami. And uh, he gave that ring to that boy and then he looked at me. A little earlier, he asked me, you stammer, don't you? I, I, I don't stammer in mm -hmm. uh, my normal... As a role, you don't, you, as a child, you don't No, 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 I, I never stammer. <coughs> so what did he mean by that? Well, at that point of time, I, I, I just took what was coming. I was too nervous. It was first interview with Swami, and I was, and I knew uh, that's the best thing. That's I'm really one thing I'm grateful for. I kept that awareness within me that I'm not with Swami, I'm with the Lord of the Universe. So I, I made sure that I was in, kept that consciousness. Sure, sure. So when he asked me this, do you stammer? I didn't care what it meant. I just said, yes, Swami. He's talking to me, that's <laughs> enough. I don't care what it Are and you an axe murderer? Yes, Swami. <laughs> I, I would have, maybe. Yes, so uh, then he tells me, he says, did you see how I blew that ring and changed that? I said, yes, Swami. He said, I'll change your, stram your stammering that way. I'll change it. Just right then and there as he was saying the words, he meant it, that he was yes, going to change uh, it. Yes, and you know, like most of the things with Swami, you do not understand it on the spot, mm -hmm. what does he mean? Because you don't even know that you're aware of stammering, no. and you didn't stammer. I but, didn't stammer. But in a, in a figurative way, maybe you did. Yes, I realized it much later, you know, you tend to reflect on all that Swami has said to you, and uh, I just wrote all the things Swami ever said to me, I wrote it down in a book. So, so as to remember it in, in the pure form, so that my Very mind doesn't smart. alter it. Most people don't do that. Very smart. Yes. Uh, I, I, in fact, when I go back to my diary, I'm amazed at something. Oh, did he really do that? Did he really say this to me? It makes a lot of sense then. And, uh, but this part I never understood. Stammering, I'll change it. I don't stammer. Why did he say that? And I realized much later that what he really meant was, uh, you're too shy to speak to people. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I'm not a social person and he was going to send me into the film industry and I had to be an assistant, mm -hmm. deal with all sorts of people, stars, <coughs> technicians and all that. And uh, I think that's where he said, I, I'll open you up, I'll help you converse. And uh, more than that, um, when I would speak to these young fellows about God or spirituality and when I write and when I see that flow com coming through me, that's when I know, okay, this is he who's doing it. Because I know myself. I st even to this day, I cannot. And um, I know when I finish this interview, I'm going to be thinking, did I say all this? Did I say all <laughs> this? Yes. So knowing that Sai Baba's not here, why did you come back? For the same reason that I've been coming, even when he was in form. It doesn't matter what the form is. I, I know, I honestly, and I'm not just saying this, uh, I know him to be in spirit with me always, <laughs> as cliché as it, as it may sound. But oh, it's a great cliché, and clichés are only clichés because they're true. <laughs> they are true, and uh, honestly, yes, there was this one time where I let myself weep out. Okay, so he's left his form, you're not going to see that charming form, walk amongst us again, take yeah. letters, yeah. make the small funny remarks and all those things. Uh -huh. But, uh, yeah, end of an era, and, uh, but I knew deep in my heart, and like I said, in the last five, six years, um, I did not have any direct interaction with him. And uh, I knew somewhere inside that this is some kind of a preparation going on to help me. And uh, truth be told, um, I, I feel him always all around me. Um, he's given me the strength to believe that. And I, I wish I could say this again and again, I'm not just saying it. Mm -hmm. I, I can feel it. Today when I'm in Bombay or wherever I am, I feel his presence just as... In the last six years I never felt the need to come to Puttaparthi to see him. Mm -hmm. I was fine wherever I was. I could go deeper than and pray to him and uh, tell him anything, ask him anything. 
Boy, that's a great testimony. I'm so happy to hear it because I, my, my feeling is, and it's becoming a larger and larger feeling. Now, you may be the exception to this, that the higher up the flagpole you go as you climb your way through the spiritual levels of different challenges, the challenges get to be more numerous and tougher. Now, I don't know if that's the way it is for you. Something tells me you handle everything that comes your way just like that. But in my view, the challenges are becoming more numerous and tougher. <laughs> when, when I thought, when I started on this path, just the opposite would happen. Yeah. What about for you and what do you make of that assessment? That's universal, Ted, like I... Like on I the said. spiritual path, that's universal? Yes. Um, encountering difficulties, like I said, this, this earth that we've come to, this life, it is a university. It is that course that we are taking to graduate in our soul awareness. So, um, and as we go through each grade, the next grade will bring more difficulties <laughs> and more, uh, uh, you know, difficult scenarios for you, and that is to be expected. I don't believe Yogananda ever talked about that in his book. <laughs> well, no, but I, um, I have heard a lot of the discourses given by his disciples, and who mention about not just his teachings, but, but their everyday experience with him, and it implies the same, like, um, it's, it's natural that, uh, the higher you climb, the more difficult it becomes mm -hmm. to earn that. And that's not to pull you down, that's to further strengthen you. And nonetheless, the, the payoff, the dividends, the blessings along the way are so valuable that you would never think of getting off this path, most people, I think. You know, I, I hope I can recollect this, because uh, this one statement that um, Sri Yogananda made, it answers that. He says that, uh, all the difficulties, all the pains that I took to reach my goal, when I found what I found at the end of my goal, it was more than worth it. He said, in fact, I would take a million lives again and mm -hmm. again and again, go through that whole process again, if this is what the goal is. Mm, geez, wow. And that says it. we got a couple of minutes left, and I want to ask you about Yogananda versus Sai Baba. And I bring this up on purpose. I think you and I have probably nearly 100% identical views on this. But there's a lot of, in America, the term is diehards, um, passionate zealots who live, breathe, and think Sai Baba as the 100% content that fills their being, as I think you do and I do. And yet, there's also room for other modalities, for other teachers, gurus, I think, to make valuable contributions to help you see Baba's message even more clearly. You're speaking about Yogananda. I don't think I've heard anybody ever be critical of anything that Yogananda has said or written, but I do know of people who say you sh that people should be 100% just Baba. And, and um, explain to me how you reconcile, you don't justify it, you live with both 100% capacity. Well, Ted, who? The people who say 100% Baba or 100% Yogananda, they're absolutely right. They're <laughs> absolutely right. Loyalty is an essential, essential, essential tool if you are to walk on the spiritual path without wavering or without faltering or without missing your path, you know. I have questioned, I mean, I myself asked Swami or my Guru many times, why was this scheme of things orchestrated for me that I come to Swami first, he leads me to this and then this. I mean, I'm a young boy, how do I deal with this? Mm -hmm. when, especially when I read, I have to be loyal, I have to be this. And, and somewhere down the line, something came to me. And uh, I'll share this with you. This is, I think it was just for me. I don't think I can make, um, ask somebody else to follow this. But the thought that came to me was, it was my guru saying, if you believe me to be your guru, that I have taken the charge of your life, you know, and to lead you from who you are in your current state towards the God realization state. Then you must trust that every single thing that comes to you which teaches your soul is coming from me, irrespective whether it has a book that says Paramahansa Yogananda or says Satya Sai Baba. Mm -hmm. It's my duty to ensure that your soul grows and know that when you gave yourself to me from that point on, Whatever teaches, teaching has come to you from whatever source is my grace. And yeah. I believe that. 
I absolutely believe that. I have read a lot of Sri Ramakrishna Paramahansa books. I love it. I love reading his books. And somewhere when Adam, when I feel gratitude, it goes to my guru. Mm -hmm. I don't see any differentiation. It's the same energy. I think it's part of Maya to see the difference. Right. The one person who is creating this world is called Brahma, the same person preserving it as Vishnu, the same person destroying it as Shiva. Just as your Ted, who is a father to somebody, a husband to somebody, a brother to somebody, a friend to somebody, you're the same person. Mm -hmm. It is no difference. And but I think... Go ahead. Sorry. No, go um, ahead. I think down the spiritual line, when you have walked the path long enough, uh, maybe this concession comes to you, where you're able to enjoy the same sweetness of divinity in different forms. But until then, I think being loyal to one path is, is a must. Who's Sai Baba? Ted, if I could, if I would attempt an answer to that, I would not. Uh, that simply means I don't know who he is. If there's anybody out there who needs to know more, I think the better way, and this is my way of doing it. If, if I have any questions, I close my eyes and I release it to the source, and I said, "Okay, I've done my part. It's your job to give me answer. It doesn't matter whether it comes through me or through anybody. Yeah. The source knows best." All right. Thank you, Nirish. Sairam. Sairam. Um, I need to speak about Swami, and I realize that uh, this interview has been a bit about Swami and a bit about... Uh, I think what I'll tell you is, um, before I came to this interview,